goodness. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, guys. Boy, you guys are so amazing. I, I know it's uh, to touch our hearts and lives. Good night at Christmas time like this. I know it's, um, you know, our band, we're used to them leading us in praise and worship and doing all kinds of great things, but uh, Christmas time is, is a different kind of stuff, you know, it's a different kind of music, it's different in its appeal and what it says, and you only do it a little bit each year, so it's, uh, you know, you just have to kind of relearn and get the feel for everything that's going on. I don't know if you guys notice this, do you notice how... Christmas music seems so appropriate during the Christmas season, but if you hear it at other times of the year, it seems to be kind of be out of place. Like, Joy to the World in July is, uh, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it's still true, but it just kind of seems a little awkward and out of place. Hark the Herald Angels sings, and no, you know, in September is like, it's still true, but it's a little bit, uh, a little bit awkward with all of that. So thank you, man. I know it's very difficult to just kind of roll in and, and do some of these things that you don't do very often, and uh, and and still do it so well. And we praise the Lord for it. Of course, I wouldn't expect anything less, would you? No, it's it's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome to do some great things, man. Let me get my little stand because I do have something to say to you today. Uh, I didn't give you an outline because uh, it really, what I'm going to say, I don't, I don't think, it really doesn't need an outline because it's only really three little points and they're real easy and you can write them on a sheet of paper easily. Uh, you might need to write yourself a note or two so you can kind of carry the thought about this. I hope it'll be something that'll be interesting to you and impactful to you. Because it is to me, um, I, have, I was studying this, this past week and preparing myself and asking the Lord what to, what to share with you. Um, I know, you know lots of you may say, preacher, how do you determine what to do, how, what to share with us? Well, I mean, I pray about it. I ask the Lord, Lord, give me, you know, give me your word. What is it that you want to say to us? And then I try to pay attention and listen to the Lord. And you say, how do you hear him? Does he come in the window or, you know, does he speak to you on the porch swing or what is it? And when you hear people say that, you've, you've heard others say that kind of thing before. You've heard preachers and evangelists and teachers say, the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, and you're probably trying to envision what, what does that look like when the Lord speaks to you? What, I mean, tell me what it actually is. Well, it's deep in here. It's, it's, uh, it's when you start thinking about different passages. It's just the Lord starts rolling memories and thoughts through your mind and, and different concepts of, of things. And as a pastor, you know, I'm always looking for a word from him about my direction for you guys because, I mean, there are lots of things I can preach about. I can preach about almost anything. I mean, I've been at it for 43 years. So almost any subject you bring up, I got eight or ten messages about what well, almost anything. And as most of you know, I don't really suffer from a lack of something to talk about. Uh, you know, it's usually the other way around. It's usually what can I leave out? You know, that's really what I'm searching for. I, I talked with Wesley. Wesley's preparing for the ministry and knows that God's called him to the ministry, and he's. He's in college now, actually, preparing himself to be used by God as a pastor or a, or a minister of some type and asking the Lord what is he want him to do. And I was right there, I, Wesley. I, I remember exactly how that feels. You know what I said to the Lord? Whatever you want me to do, look in your garbage can, God. I mean, this is how, this is how audacious I was when I was Wesley's age. I told the Lord... And be careful what you what you say to the Lord too. I'm just this is just like a warning, and I know you've heard me say this before. But I look, yeah, I looked and I looked and I asked the Lord. I was deep in prayer, seriously, and I was just as serious as I could be. I said, Lord, just look in your garbage can, and whatever nobody else wants to do, give it to me. I'll do it, you know. And uh, that was just my way of saying whatever you want me to do. It doesn't have to be glamorous. It doesn't have to be glorious. I don't have to be a star somewhere. Uh, just whatever you have that that others might shy away from, give it to me and I'll do it. And lo and behold, he's done that all these years. Not that you guys are garbage. I'm not implying that, all right? I'm not implying that you guys are in the garbage can somewhere and God said, let me give you to somebody that'll, you know, clean out the garbage can. I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that God has called 
me to pastor you and to be responsible for what I say and what I teach and what I preach because you are important to God. You are, you are part of his family. You, you are part of our family. I love you. I want you, to, I want you to understand things. I want you to grow. I want you to be sufficient yeah. for yeah. everything. I want you to understand yeah. things from the word because it's the word of God that teaches our heart and life. It's the word of God that makes a difference in you. It's not a philosophy. It's not a psychology. I mean, what, what kind of psychology could you, could you employ that would change your whole concept of life? What kind of, what, kind of, what kind of philosophy could you have that would cause you to leave everything you have and follow someone you've never seen before? No, no, no philosophy, no psychology, no teaching, no mantra is going to do that. The Word of God that exposes truth to you is what changes your life. And when you need the Lord, it's not, a, it's not a fuzzy feeling that you're looking for. It's a solid fact. And it's the Word of God that gives us fact. Uh, the Bible and many of the, those who were led by the Spirit as they wrote in the Word of God calls it the Word of truth. It's the Word of truth. And you never know the truth about a subject until God tells you the truth about a subject. That's right. You may think that it's dead and gone. There was a widow woman one day or, that had a son, and her son was uh, sick unto death, and she was bringing him to Jesus, and the boy, the boy died. And the widow woman, when she approached Jesus, uh, and she said to Jesus, my husband's dead, and now my son is dead, and what am I to do? And Jesus says, your boy's not dead. He's just asleep. And, mm -hmm. and she looked, and he was alive again. And that just signifies, I'm just using that example to tell you that you don't know the truth until Jesus tells you the truth. Because to her, the truth was her boy was dead and her husband was dead. But when Jesus spoke to her, the truth was your husband may be dead, but your boy's alive. Because it, you, you never have the last word on anything until God gives you the last words. What I'm trying to say to you. Yeah. And so I'm, I, you know, I'm been preaching. I've been preaching through the book of James, and I hope you've been getting from what I've been saying out of James. I, honestly, seriously, the book of James is such a deep and intricate book that it has four or five directions that you could go. On almost any chapter in the book of James. I mean, ways that you could teach it, things that are important about it, and, and, and you know, uh, outlines and thoughts and, and, and issues and facts and truths and so forth. But the Lord has laid it on my heart as I've taught through, and I hope you have picked up on this, that, that I'm looking at the passion of James to tell us how important the Word of God is in our lives because it's the Word of God that changes you and matters in the direction you go in life. And when James teaches you, he says, let me tell you how valuable the Word is to you when bad stuff starts happening in your life. It's the Word of God that's going to speak to you about how to respond to that and how to get good from that and how to grow from that rather than be defeated by that. So he, he's almost like a cheerleader in every chapter saying, don't forget the word. Know the word. Understand the word. Grab on to the word because that's what matters in life. That's what will change your direction and thought about everything to do with life. With that thought in mind, I back to the original thought here. <laughs> Back to the original, uh, as I've been considering Christmas this year, uh, plan of next week and the following week, of course, uh, 17th and then Christmas Eve to share with you some thoughts about some specific passages about the Christmas season and about what God did and all those kind of things. But I thought today, I said, now, what, we're, we're kind of in that little murky in-between right now. We're close enough to Christmas to be thinking about it and kind of looking at it. But we're, you know, we're three weeks away, and I'm thinking, man, what, would, what do you want to say today, Lord, about, about this? And I, I was led to several passages that uh, have been important in, in my life, and I've studied them, and, and I've... Lord's spoken in my heart about them, but I've never preached anything about this, about what I'm going to share with you today. 
I know that's hard to believe in 43 years. You say, you've never shared what you're going to share today in 43 years? Never have. Never have. So this is like a new thing for me. And, uh, and I want to I wanna share this with you because I, I feel that it's important uh, that, you, that you know this because when you know this, it, it'll, it'll help you to respect God even more than you do because it's, it, 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 it calls attention to the fact that God is holy, that God is just, that God is love, that, that there, are, there are truths in the Word to show us how, just how, how uh, when God speaks and God creates uh, a, a, an ordinance, a, a truth, a direction, that even he himself will not violate that, and it becomes a word. It becomes a truth. When God says it, it changes things, and that even he himself is bound by his own word that he speaks to not violate that word because of who he is and the nature of God. And I know that sounds mighty theological, and it is theological. Look at your neighbor and says, this is theology. Okay, look at him and say, I hope you're not bored. Okay, <laughs> if, I, if I sense you sleeping, I'm going to start preaching on hell or something. I don't know. And you're going to be going there. Mm. I'm going to be hot about it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sleep away. All right. All right. Here is, here is, here's, what, here's the premise, and here's what we're looking at. Um, I, want to, I want to share with you today the reason, the purpose for Christmas. Not, not the purpose of it, like what it accomplished, but why does it even exist at all? Why did God have to come to earth and be born like a baby in a manger through a virgin without a man in it? I mean, you know this is what happened. What happened in the birth of Jesus was that there was a, a baby inside the womb of a mother who had no earthly father. There was not a man in it. God took a woman without a man in it and put in her womb, built her. I mean, I don't want to get too, you know, graphic. It's not anything unnatural or ugly, but some of you get embarrassed when, when I talk about anything that's, you know, biological or anything about women and men. But, you know, be, be nervous. I'm not going to go too far, so y'all don't be nervous. But God built the body of a woman to, for a child to inhabit the womb whose blood does not mix with mom. Th th just think about this. This is just uh, amazing that inside a womb, God has created a little haven where a child can be placed and be completely separated from the mom in some vital ways, like mom's blood doesn't flow into through the placenta and flow into the child and flow through the child's vein and flow back out and flow up in her heart and flow. God creates it where the child has its own bloodstream and a child can have even a different type of blood than mom. Uh, she could be a positive, he could be a negative based on what dad is and or vice versa. And some of you moms have been there and you've had to take these shots because there was a possibility that in the birth some of that blood might get loose or whatever and then you'll have a reaction because your blood's not like the child's blood. And I'm just saying God did this. God created this body, this, this womb of a mother so that he could place a child in there one day who would not be polluted with the, with the polluted blood of mankind. And I know this might sound odd, and it might, you know, you're saying, Pastor, you may be making too much out of this, but, but I, I, I want you to know that when man sinned on this earth, man fell away from God. And you say, what does that mean? Well, it means we made a choice in the garden, and in that choice in the garden, we chose to disobey God. We chose to violate his word to us. His word was, you can eat of any of the trees in this garden. Everything is at your disposal. 
I'm not holding anything back from you, but the, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the middle of the garden, in the midst of the garden, you, you don't eat of that tree because the day that you eat of that tree, the moment you eat of the tree, the milliseconds you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. So from the moment Adam and Eve, I mean, when Eve ate of the tree, nothing happened. I don't know if you're aware of this. If you read the passage in Genesis 3, Satan seduces Eve and he beguiles Eve and she partakes of the fruit. The Bible says when she saw that the fruit was good for food and pleasant to the eyes, and, 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 and would make her wise and good, she took the fruit and ate the fruit. And then she gave the fruit to Adam, and he did eat. And at the moment, you read it in the passage in Genesis 3, at the moment that he did eat, the next verse says, and their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked before God. In other words, something happened in that split second where Adam took of the fruit and ate of the fruit. I mean, when Eve did it, 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 it didn't cause any great upheaval. It didn't cause any tremendous uh, uh, curse to follow man. But the moment she gave it to Adam and he ate, he was not beguiled by a serpent. He was not seduced by a serpent. He was given this fruit by his wife, Eve. And when he made a choice, when he said, I'm going to, I have a choice now. Either I'm going to obey God or forever I'm going to be separated from this creature that God has made for me because now she has violated the word of God. God said, don't eat of it or you'll die. And now she has eaten of it. So I have a choice. I have a choice to either continue to obey God and not eat or to give her up because I can't now I can't fellowship with her because she has fallen away. She's become cursed. She's become separate from me. And so he made a choice and he chose his wife and instead of God. And the moment he partook of that fruit, the Bible says their eyes were opened and they realized they were naked and they ran away and hid from God. And God comes walking through the garden like he always does with Adam and Eve and he says, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I'm over here behind this tree, God. And he says, what you doing behind the tree? Have you done something that I said don't do? And Adam said, well, you know, well, I knew I'm naked and I, I'm embarrassed by it. So God says, uh-huh. It wasn't as if God didn't know what happened. This was just asking for the confirmation of this. It's asking, Adam, do you know what you did? Are you aware of what just happened? And from that point right there, and I don't want this to sound too dramatic, but from that point right there, humanity became polluted by the blood of man. In other words, every child that is born on this earth receives polluted blood, blood that is sin-bound, blood that is passed from generation before that was that was polluted because it was passed from the generation before that was polluted, from the generation before that that was polluted, all the way back to the, to the first children that were born on the face of this earth by blood from a polluted dad and a polluted mom. So when Jesus was born, he had to be placed inside the, virg the, the womb of a virgin a wound that had never been violated by polluted blood. And she was placed in there without a man in it, without a dad, without a human father in it. But the, but the Spirit of God hovered over Mary, and Mary became pregnant with a child. And so the child, who's now in the womb of a virgin, isolated because of the way God created a woman, I mean, isn't this amazing that even as God created you, ladies, he created you with the opportunity in mind that one day there might need to be something placed inside of you that could be shielded away from the polluted blood of mankind. Even your own polluted blood would not flow into the vessel that was on the inside of you. And that God create, could create a natural incubator 
so that the Savior of this world who had the blood of God flowing in his body inside the womb of a mother whose blood would not transfer across the placenta, the barrier that was there, and he could be born of a virgin without polluted blood but with a dirt body. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, we have to have a dirt body. A dirt body. So can you accept all of that that I just said? Okay, this is not foreign to you. I mean, this is not weirdo out in Twilight Zone stuff. I'm just telling you the reason for Christmas, the reason we have Christmas. Why, why did Jesus have to come to the earth? Why couldn't this just be declared from heaven? Why couldn't it just be like God sitting in heaven and all of a sudden he makes a pronouncement and said, all right, everybody on earth is free from their bondage of sin. Why did, why did there have to be a baby born? Why did this baby have to be born of a virgin? Why did God have to put on a dirt body? Couldn't he just speak as a spirit? I mean, this, couldn't he just say it? And, 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 and now we didn't have to go through the birth. We didn't have to go through the cross. We didn't, have to, we didn't have to see Jesus suffer and bleed and die for our sins and rebellion against God was there. Why, why did that have to happen? You ever ask yourself that? Why? I mean, we know it did. And we know, you know, it was a great picture. It was a great example. It was a great lesson that we learned. And I know we can look at it and we can get lots of valuable things from it. We can see the humility of Christ. We can see the suffering of Christ. We can appreciate what God did for us more than ever by watching him be beaten and watching the spear be stuck in his side and hearing him scream from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, there are lots of reasons and things we get from it, but the question is, why did it have to be? Could God have done this some other way? Look at your, look at your neighbor and say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Because Christmas was, was a prophecy. Christmas had to happen. Christmas was a promise from God long ago. And let me just share with you why Christmas had to happen. Are you interested in that? Okay. This is theology now. Okay, I want you to know that, so don't. Don't, you know, this is not somebody, something in a grocery store somebody might like. This is the theology. <laughs> Number one, why did Christmas have to happen? Because God is holy. God is holy. Why did, why did Christmas have to happen? Because God is holy. That's why. That's one reason. What does holy mean? Holy means set apart. Holy means sacred. Holy means uh uh, fundamental, holy means uh, faithful. God is faithful. God is true. God, when God says things, he is faithful to what he said. He is holy. Let me show you what, I'm going to skip over. I think I have the first one. I'm going to skip over this one and go to this one. In Isaiah chapter 6, this is Isaiah the prophet in the Old Testament. And I'm jumping in on verse 3, and let me just set it up for just a second. This is the prophecy. This is the word that God spoke to Isaiah the prophet in the Old Testament and, and, and was asking uh, who would go out and be a witness for him. And, and, and Isaiah said, and, and, and I looked up, and behold, I saw seraphim angels which is a type of angels. There are three types of angels mentioned in the Bible, or four. Uh, there are seraphim angels, and they're described as angels with six wings here in Isaiah chapter 3. Uh, two, they covered their feet. Two, they covered their eyes. And one, set they, they, they flew with. Weird-looking creatures, right? And Isaiah said, I looked up and I saw, and, and these seraphim were flying around, and one of these seraphim was saying, was saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then they asked the question, who shall go for me? And Isaiah said, you know, I'm a man of unclean lips. And the angels took the coal off the altar and put it on his lips. And, and Isaiah, you know, became the prophet of God. This is, but the point I want you to see is that the Bible tells us that the Lord is holy. That God is faithful to his word. That when God speaks something, that it becomes the law. It becomes what must happen. That God doesn't just carelessly say words like we do. We say things all the time, and 
And those things sometimes have consequences and sometimes they don't. But I'm just saying to you that we have to have Christmas because of what God said. Because he's true to the words that he speaks and he is holy and he is faithful. And, 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 and Christmas is a result of the holiness of God. I know you're saying, well, what are, what are you talking about? Well, I'm going to go back. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. This is the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis. And notice what happens in the first book of the Bible when God is going to create man. He's going to create man first, and then he's going to create woman. And, and God said, let us make man, all mankind, in our image. Notice that he's talking to somebody it's an hour. You say, who is that? Well, there's the Father there, there's the Son there, and there's the Holy Spirit there. And I know you're saying, three? I thought of God was one. Well, he is. But this is called the, tr the Trinity, the triune of God. And I'm not going to even explain it because I don't know that I can explain Trinity. All I can say is there are three, and they all three are one. It's just like water's water, water's snow, and water steam. I mean, there are three forms, but they all are water. God says, you know, there are three of me, the Father me, the Son me, and the Holy Spirit me, but we're all three one. And you can see all three of them operate when Jesus was baptized as an example. Here's the Son in the Jordan River with John putting him under the water, and the Holy Spirit is lighting on his shoulder in the form of a dove, and the Father is speaking from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, I know what the Trinity is, how to explain it, I don't know. Uh, we can ask the Lord one day if we, if we, when we stand before him, but uh, you'll already know by then. <laughs> but you're not going to get it explained by me. I'm just telling you that it's true. And, and here's an example of God speaking and God saying to the, those around him, he's not talking to angels because angels aren't made like us. Angels are created by God, but they don't have bodies like us. They're not sexual like us. You know, they, they don't, they're not humans. I, by the way, and I'm getting all off course, but, but y you'll never be an angel. I know people te teach that kind of goofy stuff, and people believe that at funerals and stuff like that. And you, it might, I don't know, you might even be thought, that might even comfort you. And if it does, I'm sorry to tear down that, that thought. But you're not an angel. You never will be an angel. An angel is a created being. A separate created being for God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we will be in the presence of angels one day. In other words, when you go to heaven, you're not an angel. You are a son of God. You are an adopted son of God. Jesus is your brother. God is your father. When you get to heaven, you're going to be changed all right, but you're not going to be changed into an angel because an angel is an angel is an angel is an angel. And a person is a person is a person is a person. When you get to heaven, you're going to see angels. You're going to be around angels, but you're not going to be one, all right? You're going to be in the presence of the angel. It says there was rejoicing in the presence of the angels. So who's doing the rejoicing? Those of us that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb who know what it means to be a sinner and knows what it means to be forgiven of our sin. The reason angels can't rejoice is they don't know anything about sin. They don't know how, how sin feels. They don't know how it feels to be dirty and grimy and, and guilty before God. So they don't know how to rejoice about having it washed clean from them because they're created by God and they serve a purpose. There are cherubim in the Bible. There are seraphim in the Bible. There are archangels in the Bible. We have the names of three angels in the Bible only. One of them is named Gabriel. He's the one that speaks to Mary and and Joseph, there is one named Michael, who's the protector of Israel, and he seems to be the fighter angel out of the bunch. And I'm sure it was Michael that came down and destroyed the Philistines when they stole the Ark of the Covenant and killed 19,000 of them in about a breath, you know, just like that. And the Philippians, uh, the Philistines said, oh, my goodness, let's throw this thing back. And they hooked it to a bunch of milk cows and sent it back toward Israel. They thought they were going to be blessed because they had stolen the ark of God, but, but they tried to open it up. You've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. That stuff for real, man. The, Phil the Philistines tried to do that. They tried to open it up thinking, man, we're going to get God. Yeah, they got God. 19,000 of them died right there on the spot. I'm sure that was Michael that did that, by the way. 
And then the other angel mentioned is Lucifer. Lucifer was an archangel. He was one that, that, that danced and praised and led the heavenly choir around the throne of God, singing worship to God continually. This is why the devil gets so angry when we worship the Lord, because we remind him of what he lost. He was there, and he got exalted in himself. Read Isaiah chapter 14. You'll see it. Lucifer fell. Lucifer was kicked out. Lucifer who decided he would be greater than God. And Isaiah says, and he was removed from heaven. So Lucifer, an unemployed archangel, now finds himself wandering around earth looking for a job. He wanders into the Garden of Eden where God has just created Adam and Eve and given them some rules. And here are the rules. And God said, let us make man in our own image or in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. This is really important now. Remember, this is God speaking. God is saying now, God is creating a new order. God is creating a new function, a new operation. Remember, God doesn't just say things like we do. God doesn't just run off at the mouth and, you know, he's serious sometimes and he's joking sometimes. When God speaks, God is bound by what he just said. So he's creating an order now, and it's an order about dominion on this earth. You see it? And, and, and let's create man in our image after our own likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle. Notice this next line, and over all the earth. So what has just happened here? What has just happened here is God has said, that on this earth, on this terra firma, firma, on this ground, on this planet that I've just created, I have placed man. You remember the first day he separates, you know, darkness from light and then, um, the, in the sea from the dry land, and then he creates animals, he creates plant life. On the sixth day, this is the sixth day he creates in our own image, after our own likeness, let us create man, and he creates man, and then he speaks and he says, this new creation, this dirt body person, this person who has a body made out of dirt and a spirit blown in his nostrils by me. So we are a spiritual being. Everybody say this. I am a spirit. I, am a spirit. I, have, a soul. I have a soul. I live in a body. To be a human being on this earth, you must have a spirit, you must have a soul, which are given you by God, and you must have a dirt house called a body that you live in. Now, I'm going to take it just one little thought further for a moment, and let me say it to you like this. In order to legally occupy this earth, Legally now, in the, in the realm of the spirit, in the realm of God, as a spiritual being to be legal on this earth, you must have a dirt body and a spirit. God has just given his creature who he created with a dirt body and has grown a spirit inside dominion over this earth. So in other words, God himself doesn't have dominion over the earth. You know why? Because God's a spirit at this point. In other words, God said, I can speak to you. I can guide you. I can encourage you. I can try to lead you. But I don't have the authority on this earth anymore because I myself am not a dirt body. I'm a spiritual being. So... God has now said that us, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let, let, let him have dominion over the earth. So now I know, wow, we're now responsible. The human race is now responsible for what happens on earth. The human race is now responsible for the decisions we make, for the direction we take for what we allow on earth and what we don't allow, how we act, how we behave. And God said, God didn't say, all right, let us have dominion on the earth. He said, let them have dominion on earth. 
And I'm just saying to you, because God is holy, because God is faithful to his word, God has now spoken a word in the very beginning of all things that has said, I am giving them, everybody looks at your neighbor and point at him and said, he's talking about you, he's talking about you, I am giving them dominion over the earth, and if, if there is anything that is going to dwell here legally and function here legally, it's going to have to have two things, a spirit and a dirt body. Now, here we have Lucifer walking around, who is an unemployed angel, remember. He is a spirit, and he's walking the earth, according to Isaiah 14, looking for some way to harass God, looking for some way to come against God. And here is God now that has created a brand new creature. He's taken the dust of the earth, and he's shaped the dust into the form of a body, if you take all the chemicals in your body and they're uh, reduced to their chemical substance level, it's the same as dirt. You know, you're made up of dirt. Some of you look better dirt. And, you know, <laughs> some of us are getting more dirt, but, but, but we're dirt. And, 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 we, and, and we have a spirit from God. So legally, just as God just spoke, he's given dominion over this earth to a Dirt body and a spirit. So here is Lucifer walking around on the earth illegally. He does not have a dirt body. Therefore, he has no power on this earth. He doesn't have dominion on this earth because he's illegally here. He is a spirit walking around illegally with no power to do anything to the human beings that God has just created. He wants to do this. He's aiming to do this. But now all of a sudden, he's shut out. Why? Because he doesn't have a dirt body. God also doesn't have a dirt body. God says, I'm going to have one one day, but right now, I'm simply a spirit. And so Lucifer, what happens to Lucifer? Lucifer begins to search the creation of God because, like I said, he's an, he's an unemployed you know, archangel looking for, a, looking for a body. And so Lucifer finds... What the Bible says, I'm going to skip a moment over to Genesis 2. That's just telling you that God birthed us. Here's Genesis 3. We'll stop right there. So here's Lucifer walking around over the earth, and you know the story of what happens in Genesis 3, right? In Genesis 3, it tells us that Lucifer takes, evidently goes into negotiation with the serpent because the Bible says the serpent is the most subtle of all the animals in the field. In other words, God tells us that back in the day of creation that serpents, everybody say snakes. snakes. Yes, yeah, slithery, slithery, slimy snakes. That snakes were the most beautiful, the most uh, cunning, the craftiest of all the animals that were created on the earth. Have any of you ever been like, even on, online, you can go to the, the National uh, Museum, uh, what is it called, the National Historical Museum, and you can see like fossils of, of snakes that they found that are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years old, and you can look at them and tucked inside their bones, you'll see some like little legs tucked back in there. They really are. I mean, just the Natural History Museum, go look at it online. You'll see them. They're, the fossils are actually, and you see these little tiny legs tucked back, like close to their body like this, like as if they had legs at one time. And so the serpent most likely did have some legs at one time because his curse was to crawl on his belly. And if he was already crawling on his belly, then you wouldn't need to curse him by crawling on his belly. So, you know, I'm just saying to you that he didn't look like he does now that he was very attractive, that he was very beautiful, that he was cunning, that he was smooth-tongued, so to speak. And so Lucifer enters into negotiation with this creature who has an earth body, who has a dirt body, although that dirt body is not designed for Lucifer to inhabit, it is a dirt body. And Lucifer goes into negotiation with the serpent, and he actually talks the serpent into allowing him to enter his dirt body. 
And so now Lucifer enters into the dirt body of a serpent, and now he is here. He is, he is illegally legal, so to speak. He's here illegally but he has technically become legal because he technically now has a dirt body, even though it was not a dirt body that was intended for him. It wasn't built for him. He does now inhabit it, and he goes to Eve, and now he is illegally legal, but now he speaks to Eve, and he begins to tell her all the great things. Has God said that you can't eat of any of these trees in the garden? And she says, no. God didn't say we couldn't eat of any of them. God just said of the one in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we can't eat. And Satan says, well, why doesn't he want you to eat? Because he wants to restrict you from knowing something about yourself. He wants you to, he thinks that if you eat, he, you're going to be smarter than him. You, you don't, look, you're not going to die when you eat of that. Uh, that's crazy. Come on, man, you're going to die. I mean, in Satan seduces, beguiles Eve. And Eve does, and we know the story, and I mentioned it, eat, eat, and boom, pow, death right there on the spot. The moment she eats, the moment Adam eats. But Satan has beguiled her. Everybody say Merry Christmas. From that moment forward, Christmas becomes the prophecy of God on this earth, and we have Christmas because of the holiness of God, because God is now spoken, and God must keep his word, and God is faithful to his word, and God doesn't violate his word, and he has given dominion to a dirt body spirit person on this earth, and as of this moment, he doesn't have a dirt body. He has a spirit, but no dirt body. One of these days he will have one. One of these days he will come to the earth and he will be legally legal to make negotiations for man. So we have Christmas because God is holy and God speaks to the, to the, to, to the, the devil, Lucifer, who's inside the body of a serpent. Notice what he says to him. And, and the Lord God said to the serpent, now this is the curse. You remember, everything gets cursed because of the violation of, of this, of this uh, of eating of the, the tree, of disobeying God. And, and, and God curses the earth and says, thorns and thistles you're going to bring forth and all that stuff. He curses man and says, by the sweat of your face, are you going to earn your living? Thank you, devil, for that. Um, and then he says to the woman, you're going to have pain in childbirth, and you're going to be subject to your husband, and he's going to rule over you. And then he says to the serpent this, so the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all of the cattle and more than every beast of the field, and, and on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, so he changes his body, and he no longer walks. He crawls and slithers on this earth, and he eats dust, and that's his curse. And he goes on to say, verse 15, and I will put enmity. Everybody say hostility. hostility. Continual hostility. What does enmity mean? Enmity doesn't mean warfare. Enmity means ill will. It means hostility. It means I'm going to put between your seed and her seed... Everybody say Jesus, <laughs> her seed, Jesus. I'm going to put enmity, I'm going to put continued hostility, continued ill will, continued uh, it, hatred may be too much of a word, but it would go in that vein between you, your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Wow, what a prophecy. That prophecy right there is a prophecy saying Christmas is on its way. That prophecy right there says there has to be a Christmas one day because there has to be a seed born of a dirt body that has legal rights to reclaim what Lucifer has now illegally legal stolen from humanity. So from this point on, Christmas is on its way because God is faithful to his word 
God is true to his word, and he said, I'm giving you dominion, and then we gave it away. We no longer have it. We've given it to Lucifer. We've given it to the devil. We've given him authority on this earth, and there's no way that we can get it back unless, unless somehow God comes to live in a dirt body on this earth. So because of the holiness of God, we have Christmas. Second, because God is just. Now, I'm out of time, obviously, of course, right in the middle of the, all of this. I'm sorry, guys. I know you can't, you know, you can't, it's, it's hard to endure everything, but, but let me just, let me, let me say this to you, and I'll, I'll close this down, because I doubt whether you want to keep on going on this next week. But God is just. It just means God is uh, legal. God is righteous. God does the right thing. God makes the right judgments. Everywhere in the Bible, it tells us that God is righteous, that God's judgments are true. Um, a judgment means that there is a law, and somebody is trying to live by the law, and you either have a good judgment or a bad judgment. And you, you remember in the Bible, like, like this, God says to you, give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, will men give to you if you give. And with what measure you give, it's going to be measured back to you. All right, That is a command from God, right? Now, if you give like that, the judgment is you get good stuff back. If you disobey that, the judgment is you don't get good stuff back. What I'm saying to you is judgment can either be good or bad based on what you've done with the command of God. The command of God is be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he reaps of the flesh, rotten flesh. So when God says, uh, don't be deceived, you're going to reap what you sow. If you sow good things, the judgment is good, right? I'm just trying to show you that judgment that we think about as being negative all the time is not always negative. Uh, you're blessed because of a good judgment. You're saved because of a good judgment. You would be cursed if it was a bad judgment because you've done bad things. And what I'm saying here is that the reason we have Christmas is because God has to have a dirt body in order to be legally legal. In order to, 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 be, to do what his word said and let them have dominion, he has to have a body like us in order to be legal on this earth to make any kind of transaction concerning mankind because we are the, are the dominators of this earth according to his own word. And the judgment, the justice of God says that the moment we eat of that fruit, we start dying. So I'm saying that Christmas had to come because God's judgment was, you're dying from the moment that fruit was eaten. And so something had to be done. If you, if he doesn't do something, you're going to have to die for your own sins. Either somebody's got to die, is what I'm saying. From the moment that happens, somebody's got to die. Either God has to die or you have to die, one or the other. And so because God is holy and because God is just, God has to do something about the fact that once that fruit was partaken of, a time clock was set in order, and somebody is going to die from that moment forward. So we must, because God is just, and then here's the last one. This, this is a great passage from Isaiah 53. I can show you a lot of stuff. But Jesus, Jesus had to come because from the moment man ate, Somebody had to die. And then the third thing is because God is love. Now, follow me one second. I didn't say he has love. I said he is love. Love is him. He is love. So because God loves you, in 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible gives us 16 descriptions of what love is. You remember them? Love is kind, love is patient, love doesn't seek its own, love uh, doesn't provoke, love is, you know, suffers long. And then it ends, the final word it says is, love never fails. 
Love doesn't, doesn't give up on you. Love doesn't quit. Love, love is powerful. Love never ends. And I'm just saying to you, because of the love of God for you, there had to be a Christmas. Because I just told you that because of the justice of God, somebody's got to die. And because God loves you so much, God said, I'll die for you. God says, I don't want you to die. I want, I'll die for you. And, and so verses like John understood completely the writer of the gospel. When God said, John said what? He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, should not die, but have everlasting life. For, for, for the wages of sin is death. Paul says in the book of Romans, for the wages of sin is death. What are wages? Wages are what I get paid for what I do. When I work a week on my job, I get a paycheck. Those are my wages. What is, what is Paul saying in Romans? What we deserve for the life we live is we deserve to die and go to hell. That's what we've earned out of our life. But it doesn't stop there. It says, but, and but always changes things, right? <laughs> the gift of God, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So because of the love of God, Christmas had to come because God had to have a dirt body and a spirit in order to be legal and to take back from Lucifer what was stolen illegally in the garden and so that mankind could be saved and not have to die on its own. When God placed Jesus inside the womb of a virgin, never had a man's blood flowing in her body, never violated with the polluted blood of mankind. In her womb was housed an earth body that was born onto this earth, containing the Spirit of God, grew up 33 years on this earth, stood before kings, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was beaten, was crucified on a cross, and suffered two things that I think most of us never really think about. We never, we, never, we never understand this. We could never understand this. You say, I know sometimes you feel like God doesn't love you, but when you feel that way, let me just remind you, there are two things that happen when Jesus died for us that we'll never understand this side of eternity. One is what Jesus had to do and how it felt for Jesus to be separated from his Father. To be, to be left alone. You know, on the cross, there were seven sayings, right? You remember them? Uh, the sayings are, uh, uh, let, let's see, this is your mom, and, and this, behold your son. Uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do, what they do. Um, it is finished. I thirst. Um, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then that one right in the middle. That, that, that dramatic one, that one that he cried out at the top of his voice, indicating that this is the most painful thing of all, when he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? When the Father had to withdraw himself from the Son so the Son could suffer, the weight of the sin of humanity could be placed on him, and God could not be, God could not be connected with with sin, and so the Father had to separate himself from his Son, and Jesus had to feel the separation of his Father and the sense of loneliness and isolation and all of those things. And it was so deep, he cried in torment, Father, this is beyond more, this is more than I can stand. Why have you forsaken me? And the second thing is, once Jesus did this, now, now, now hang on with me, I'm through now. I promise you, I'm going to fix to quit. I'm going to fix to quit. When Jesus did this, when Jesus inhabited this dirt body, and when he came to earth and he went to the cross and he, and, he, and, he, and he was nailed to the cross and he was beaten and he was scarred and a spear stuck in him and all, when, he, when this happened to him, listen to this. The second thing, one is 
you'll, you will never understand what that separation felt like. And that would happen, and Jesus knew it would happen before it ever even happened it, because he was slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, and, and, and the second thing that happened is once he did this, it would never, he would never be the same again. You say, Pastor, what you talking about? I'm saying that Jesus suffered for us and it changed him and he will never be the same again. The Bible says that one of these days we're going to stand in heaven and the only scars that will be there are the scars in the hands and the feet of Jesus. In other words, he still bears the wounds. Zechariah 13, if you want to get it prophetic about it, Zechariah 13 says one of these days, Jesus is going to come down on the mount and the Jewish people are going to see him. And they're going to look at him. Now listen to this. and not, This is, read, read Zechariah 13, you'll see. The Jewish nation who are the chosen people of God, who are the ones that rejected him, the ones that put him on a cross, the ones that said he's not my, our Messiah, the one that he was sent to and rejected him. They're going to see him when he comes down on that mountain at the end. And they're going to look at Jesus and here's what they're going to say. Where'd you get those wounds? And you know what he says? In the house of my friends. So Jesus knew from the beginning that if he does this, he'll never be the same again. He'll always have these scars. He'll always have these wounds. But he loves us enough, in spite of all of that, to come and die and pay our price so that we could be redeemed. Look at your friend and say, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. All right, let's stand to your feet.